everyone. Welcome everyone uh, gathering with us virtually on live stream. Crazy times we are in. There was no traffic on the way here. So, uh, you know, it, it's really important for us to spend this time. I hope you're uh, making it a point to be here for the live stream. It, it's important to have human interaction, human contact, and this is the closest we can get right now. So, uh, it's important, uh, as we'll see this in this morning's message. You know, I just want to encourage those out there. Uh, you know, take care of yourself. And uh, I just want to remind us of things like we should be doing anyways, but exercising, uh, eating right, eating healthy. Uh, also, making the most of the time. If you're, you know, self-quarantining at home, maybe working at home, uh, you know, like the governor said, if, if someone had told you uh, months ago that you would have several months, perhaps, just to have some time uh, relaxing, then uh, you might have welcomed that. So let, let's make the most of this time uh, at your home. Maybe some books you can read. And of course, get in the Word. Spend that time in prayer. Have some meaningful conversations with your family. Just do things to redeem the time, as we're told in, his, in God's Word. Uh, I also want to mention uh, the governor, Whitmer, uh, made an announcement on... Uh, you guys, I want you with me, okay? Hey, Michael, Martez, I want you with me, okay? All right, so you maybe need to sit on the seats. Okay, but stay with me. The governor uh, granted churches an exception uh, from the penalty of a, a misdemeanor for, for gatherings even over 50. And uh, I, I want to say in, in response to that, we, it reminds me of 1 Peter 2.12, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. And uh, we, we, we want to do the most we can to be, you know, to do our part for the community, and we want to do what wisdom would dictate, and it, you know, it may seem like, oh, we're being kept from worship, but uh, Rebecca shared, my wife shared a story with me recently where a mom went, uh, a grandmother of six went to church, contracted the coronavirus there, and, uh, and died, so uh, that, that would be heartbreaking for me to to understand that someone, you know, if we continue to have services, they came here, they got sick and uh, and died. I just that would be too much. So we, we want to do be do our part, uh, and that's public perception also matters. That we need to, you know, make sure that we're not contributing to to the problem. Uh, this is not a matter of, you know, even if the governor hadn't granted us that exception, this is not a matter of the government, you know, trying to keep us from worshiping. This is a matter of the government trying to help us and protect us, uh, which is their God-given right. So uh, it reminds me of First Peter 2, 13, the very next verse says, For the Lord's sake, respect, respect all human authority, whether the king as head of state or the officials he has appointed. For the king has sent them to punish those who do wrong and to honor those who do right. It is God's will that, you on, that, you li, uh, that your honorable lives should silence those ignorant people who make foolish accusations against you. For you are free, yet you are God's slaves. So don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. Respect everyone. Love your Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God. Respect the king. So just... The Bible teaches us that uh, we are to respect and honor and obey our, our authorities, even our government, up until the point they ask us to violate our faith. And the government's not trying to do that. And keep in mind, this is being written by Peter, who uh, actually spent time in, in jail, in prison, for preaching uh, the truth. So uh, let, let's just, just a, want to take the opportunity to have a, a reminder of that. Uh, Hope you appreciated the human interaction at community groups uh, last Wednesday. Uh, I want to say if, if, uh, if and when and as we're able to have community groups gathering, uh, please stay home if you're sick. Don't, don't let your conscience, you know, violate your uh, sense of justice. Uh, stay home if you need to. Uh, take care of yourself. <clears throat> 
also I would like to have a family meeting not a meal but a meeting where we do it live stream where just we can you know discuss some family meetings uh, f family matters rather sorry and uh, if we were able to do this uh, it's either going to be this Wednesday uh, your community group will keep you informed or it's going to be the following Wednesday it will be on live stream which is on our Facebook home page uh, Facebook page or on our website home page so uh, if we do that, I, I really want it to be interactive, so I want you to be able to type in questions, what have you, and we'll have a moderator to field those questions uh, to me. So <clears throat> what I want to look at, let's pray. Let's pray together. I ask the Lord's blessing. Lord, this is uh, some interesting times we're in. And Lord, thank you that we have the technology just to continue to, uh, to meet together, even virtually to hear from you, from your word, as a people, as your people. So Lord, I pray you'd uh, help us to hear what you have for us this morning. Lord, help me to communicate clearly, and so that we might see how we are to live, uh, even during these times, live out our faith. Lord, for those who are maybe fearful, or struggling, or there's a uh, struggles that they have uh, looming on the horizon due to the situation that we're in, Lord, I pray you would comfort them, that they would take heart, that they would uh, know that this is maybe outside of our control, but it certainly is not outside of your control, Lord. So, Lord, I also lastly would just ask that you would hold us together as a church, Lord. And Lord, we just look to you for, for, for comfort, for provision, but, oh, Lord, also for opportunity to live out our faith. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Fear. And some are saying that, you know, there's a lot of fear-mongering going out there, going on out there. And uh, I just want to quickly remind us of a few things about that. Fear is meant to be a uh, check engine light on your dashboard. Fear alerts you to things that need to change in your life. Fear is not meant to be, you know, squashed down and ignored. It's meant to be addressed. But once you've done everything you possibly can, and you still have fear, that's when you need to give it to God. And that means prayer. Like, you, your family gathered, you take your your fear, you take your anxiety, you take your problems, your struggles, and all those things that are outside of your control, and through prayer, you give them over to the Lord. And you can walk away having peace after having done that. But times like this are meant to alert us to our need for God. Because aren't, aren't we seeing so many things that are, you know, outside of our control? Now, things could be worse. And things in, historically in the past have been worse. I was reminded recently, in 1918, the influenza broke out. 50, was it 50 or 55 million people died? And this is from 1918 soldiers returning from the front. And that's, that's more people died then than in World War I and World War II put together. So I'm, I'm told. So the viruses, outbreaks, sicknesses, you know, this is something that's, pl that's plagued us uh, for millennia. But in times like this, uh, a, a verse was brought to my attention this week, and I just wanted to share it with you to comfort you <clears throat> this morning. That is Psalm 33, verse 18. Psalm 33, verse 18 and following. But the Lord watches over those who fear Him, those who rely on His unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him, our hearts Rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Ultimately, our hope has to be found in him. So there's maybe some of you watching that don't even know if God exists. Or perhaps due to this, what's going on in our society, you may have opportunities to have spiritual conversations and have God conversations. And you may come across... <coughs> those who would ask this question 
Sometimes we hear this. If, if in, perhaps you'll hear this. If, if God created everything, who created God, right? And sometimes this, this question is act, uh, used as the ultimate trump card to say, you know, if, if God created everything, who created God? This is a question I appreciate, actually, because it begins to approach the magnitude of, of who God is. But here's the problem with the question. If you don't have a whole lot of options here, you either believe in a self-existing, self-existent God who never had a beginning, will never have an end, or, or you believe in a universe that's always existed, or you, believe in a, you have to believe in a universe that, that sprang into existence in, with all its complexity, with space-time, on its own. Now, for, for me, those last two options take way more faith than to believe in a self-existing God. Because God has a personality who, who exercises a will that can declare at one moment and not another, let there be light. But see, if you give up on the idea of a self-existing God, you say, I'm, it's, it's more comfortable for me to believe in a universe that's always existed or a universe that's sprang to existence all on its own. If it's more comfortable for you to go that direction, then you have to give up on something. You guys, are you with me? You have to give up on meaning and purpose such that all these things, these calamities we experience are just random. And that, that the, the idea that this life is meaningless or purposeless outside of anything that you create for yourself, there's no higher purpose, there's nothing greater than yourself, is too much for the soul to bear. There's no one out there uh, looking out for you and handling things that are outside of your control. There's this, this innate human desire for meaning and purpose, even in the suffering, in the hard times. In fact, this need for meaning and purpose is, is really what I believe drives, ultimately, conspiracy theories. So you might ask, what is the meaning behind this coronavirus? You guys have an answer for that? What would, well, broadly, it's, it's what I've already said. It's to alert us to our need for God. Specifically for Him to handle, our need for Him to handle things outside our control so that we can have what? Peace. And you can't offer peace to others if you don't have it yourself. And so really this can be a revealing thing if you don't have peace to say, to, to think maybe you're, you're subtly maybe even unaware, trying to live as if you are God yourself, if you're the God of your own life. And it's in times like this, we're alerted to the fact that we are not God. There are things that are certainly outside of our control. In times of prosperity, it's very easy for us to forget how, how fragile we really are. There are plenty of people who try to live... Uh, do life without God it's even true in our country there are plenty of people who try to do life without God who call themselves Christians and what I mean by this is that it's easy to be a Christian in name only isn't it during times of prosperity a nominal Christian but a true Christian is one who listens and obeys God's word even at the cost of suffering so if during times of prosperity, we, we call ourselves Christian, but we don't live out the faith. We don't, we're not listening and obeying God's word. We're not doing life with God. We don't have a personal relationship with him where we're submitting our will to his will. <clears throat> then what happens when you get to a time of calamity? Fear creeps in. So we can give up on God when it's either too easy when life is easy without him. When, we're, when we have prosperity, we experience prosperity, um, or we experience suffering, that's also true. Because either you give up on him and think, I don't need him because you're prospering, or you experience suffering and calamity and you think God has given up on you. Because things aren't go going according to your plan. 
But the, the appropriate response to situations outside of our control is just a reminder that we need God. If you have God, and He's promised you His presence for eternity, no more sickness, no more death, direct relationship with God, then what's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? It's good. And so we, knowing this, and having this, this, this reality, this hope presented to us, we can have peace and yet offer, and still offer that peace to others during these times. I don't want us to lose sight of this opportunity. And so I want to turn to a passage this morning. Uh, I want to go through Matthew 24 because Jesus gives us some very helpful words to, to, to communicate to us what we are to be doing. What would Jesus say? So I want to very quickly run through Matthew 24. And so if I'm, I'm moving too quickly, there's a lot of uh, interesting passages here that, that may be very confusing. I want to answer a lot of those questions. So if you're not familiar with the passage, I'm going to move quickly. You might want to go back through it later. But as I said previously, in weeks previous, Matthew 24 and 25 is, is the fifth and last teaching section or discourse section in the book of Matthew the first of course being the Sermon on the Mount and so what we have in, in Matthew 24 and 25 is Jesus has just gotten through giving the eight woes to the religious leaders to the hypocrites he's calling out religion for its hypocrisy and he ends that section in Matthew 23 by saying to, to Judaism, to, to religious leaders in Israel, to the Jews, your house has left you desolate. What house is he referring to? Ultimately, he's referring to the temple, which is the very center and heart of the Jewish religion. So much of the Mosaic law is centered around a central place of worship where God's presence is, where sacrifices and festivals, uh, it's the epicenter. And without that, how do you even do the Jewish religion? Or as we often say here, uh, Jews today are standing outside a retaining wall, the wailing wall, because they don't have a temple. So let me just pick up the story, what's going on in Matthew, at the end of Matthew 23. Jesus says this, Snakes, sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of hell? Therefore, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers of religious law, but you will kill some by crucifixion. And you will flog others with whips in your synagogues, chasing them from city to city. As a result, you will be held responsible for the murder of all godly people of all time. From the murder of righteous Abel to the murder of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you killed in the temple between the sanctuary and the altar. I tell you the truth. This judgment will fall on this generation. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned and desolate, for I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 24, verse 1. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, Do you see these buildings? And they truly were magnificent. I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when, when will all these things happen? And what will be the signal, what will signal your return and the end of the world? So two questions being asked. Now notice Jesus, what's happening here at the uh, transition between Matthew 23 and 24 is echoing what we saw back in Ezekiel chapter 8 through 11. In eight, chapter, Ezekiel 8 through 11, because of the idolatry of the nation of Israel, this, the presence of God is going out from the holy place of the temple, out through the, the temple precincts, out of the wall of the city, 
and up until to the Mount of Olives and then hovers there. And what Ezekiel is communicating to his people is that due to their sin, God is exercising judgment by removing his presence from the temple, from the city, from his people. And so when we see here that Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, he's like echoing, mirroring that story back in Ezekiel because he has said, I live, leave, I'm leaving, your house is left to you desolate. And then he goes out and he transitions from a public uh, conversation to a private discourse to his disciples. And two questions are asked. So what we have here in Matthew 24 is Jesus answering these two questions. And what's important to... <clears throat> If we're going to get a correct interpretation of this, we have to keep in mind the two questions so we see when he's answering one and when he's answering the other because what Jesus is going to take some time to do here is differentiate the two. <clears throat> so let me remind you of the two questions. When will all these things happen? What things? The temple being destroyed. Because Jesus has just said, not one stone will be left upon another. When will that happen? The disciples are asking. And so we find the answer to that, hear this, in verses 4 through 34. 4 through 34. That's important because um, you may think some of those sections, if you don't look at them correctly, you may think he's answering the second question, which is, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And so the temptation, if we, didn't under, if we don't understand what Jesus is saying, we might think that those two questions are really the, ha, going to happen at the same time. But Jesus is going to take pains to, to differentiate and say, no, these are going to happen at separate times. And the result and the helpful thing for us this morning is we live between the, these two happenings. And Jesus is, is going to boil everything down to tell us, to challenge us with something about how we should live. And I think it's particularly appropriate for us this morning living with what's going on in our culture and society today. So in verses 314, I'm going to run through this quickly because I want to get to that point, that challenge that Jesus has for us, okay? So in verses 3, 4, 3 through 14 of Matthew 24, we have this warning against premature expectation. Ben, will you start that clock for me, please? Thank you so much. I've grown dependent on that. <laughs> warning against a premature expectation of Jesus' return. Of, of He's warning us about the fact that there will be false messiahs. If you go on Wikipedia, you can find a whole long list of people who have claimed to be Jesus, who have claimed to be the returning messiah. Mormonism teaches that Jesus returned already uh, in between what we believe is Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Is that accurate? Is that, what, is that a possibility? Well, there are plenty of false messiahs. Acts, the book of Acts refers to several of these. So let me just give you the context. Acts 5.36, we read this. Some time ago, there was that fellow, Thutis, who pretended to be someone great. So the, the reference there, the illusion there, is claiming to be a messiah. <coughs> About 400 others joined him, but he was killed. And all his followers went their various ways. The whole movement came to nothing. There was Judas of Galilee. He got people to follow him, but he was killed too, and all his followers were scattered. Acts 21, 38. Aren't you the Egyptian, I'm speaking to Paul here, who led a rebellion some time ago and took 4,000 members of the assassins out into the desert? So already... In, in the book of Acts, false messiahs, uh, the record of false messiahs, this, this was happening. Jesus is warning against us, against that. Now, are there false messiahs even out there today? Are there false prophets, false teachers? Absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to see a little bit more of that and what do we do about it and momentarily. But Matthew 24, 9 through 14 says, Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And here, again, just like in the book of Revelation, we are challenged to persevere. 
and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come so there's this and I, I love this text the idea of all the nations will hear it and then the end will come verse 15 through 28 the coming crisis in Israel the coming crisis in Israel and what is this coming crisis that Jesus was referring to it's the temple being destroyed did that happen in that generation of course it did in the destruction and the war of the Jews it's called by Josephus when the Romans did in fact invade Jerusalem and took apart their temple Matthew 24 15 the day is coming when you'll see what Daniel the prophet spoke about the sacrilegious object that causes desolation standing in the holy place the abomination of desolation King James says so what Daniel wrote about and there's three passages in Daniel and one in uh, chapter 9 one in uh, chapter 11 one in chapter 12 Daniel 11.31, his army will take over the temple fortress, pollute the sanctuary, put a stop to the daily sacrifices, and set up the sacrilegious object that causes desolation. Now, what Daniel's writing about is different than what Jesus is referring to. What Jesus is saying is, the thing that, that Daniel wrote about, yeah, it's going to happen again. Antiochus Epiphanes in, in 167 BC fulfilled the Daniel uh, passage but Jesus is forecasting this happening yet again. So likely this is fulfilled when the Romans set up their standard in the temple precincts as recorded by Josephus in AD 70, when the Jews considered, which the Jews considered idolatrous. So J Josephus records that the, when the uh, Roman legions arrived and they finally broke through into Jerusalem and won the war against the Jews in that time, that they actually were offering sacrifices to their own gods there on the temple precincts but we don't know exactly when that happened it was either AD 67 or AD 70 AD 67 seems to make more sense because Jesus gives a warning that you need to flee when this begins to happen seems like if it did happen in AD 70 um, after the Romans had already come it would be too late to flee but nevertheless the point is Jesus says this is gonna, going to happen again Matthew 24, 24. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up. I want you to hear this. Perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. I want us to hear this, church, because we don't often spend time here. False messiahs, false prophets are capable of performing great signs and wonders so as to deceive. So just because someone can perform a miracle, something seemingly supernatural, does not mean they are sent from God. In fact, we're warned of this way back in Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. Suppose there are prophets among you, or those who dream dreams about the future, and they promise you signs or miracles. They make a the promise of signs and miracles. And the predicted signs or miracles occur guys will you put those away please thank you <laughs> they promise signs and wonders signs and miracles and they actually take place they actually happen if then they say come let us worship other gods gods you have not known before do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you. He's testing you to see if you truly love Him with all your heart and soul. <coughs> what do we get from this? Times of crisis leave God's people vulnerable to false prophets. And we need to be careful to test their message against Scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19-21 says, Despise not prophetic utterances, but what are we to do? test them and hold fast that which is good so just because someone performs a sign or a miracle doesn't mean they're sent from God what we're supposed to do further is then listen to the message they bring and compare that to scripture so we are not deceived it is possible we see this throughout scripture where false prophets can perform miracles 
Uh, we see that with the, with the ten plagues in uh, Moses. Pharaoh's magicians were able to perform some of the signs and mimic and copy, imitate, counterfeit the signs that Moses was doing. Matthew 24, 27, For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. And what we get from that and this is helpful for us to, hear, to understand this morning, is that when Jesus actually does come, it's going to be universal acknowledgement. The return of Jesus will be unmistakable and universally known. And that's how we can know he's actually returned. If someone comes to uh, us and says, hey, th- we think Jesus is returning, he's over here, he's hiding in the desert, or he's over here, he's in this ministry, he's in this country, he's in this place, we can know. If it's not universally known, it's not Jesus. that's helpful for us Jesus is preparing us so we're not deceived Matthew 24 34 I tell you the truth this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place so Jesus says that in verse 34 right so what what we know that that really helps us in our interpretation because what we can know is everything he's described thus far is actually an answer to that first question. When will the temple be destroyed? Because Jesus is limiting when it can and cannot happen. It has to happen within the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. He goes on further, Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. we might immediately jump to the book of Revelation and say and think this is yet future but yet what we know is because Jesus has limited himself on when this must take place within this generation we have to know it has to have already taken place and so here just like Revelation it's important for us to understand what's happening Jesus is speaking in this in this text as an Old Testament prophet so we have multiple references in Ezekiel 32 7 would be an example Joel 2 10 Amos 8 9 I'll just read one of those uh, Amos 8 9 in that day the sovereign Lord says the sovereign Lord I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth while it is still day let me just give you one more Joel 2 10 the earth quakes as they advance and the heavens tremble the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars no longer shine <coughs> if we look at these Old Testament reference and realize that Jesus is speaking as an Old Testament prophet in this text what those Old Testament texts are doing is they're using symbolic language to communicate the judgment of God sometimes on Jerusalem many times on Jerusalem sometimes it's on Babylon sometimes it's on Egypt or Edom that is symbolic language to communicate the judgment of God and that is just what Jesus is, is doing here with the symbolic language so it's appropriate that Jesus would use such language again because God's judgment is coming on Jerusalem for rejecting the Messiah. That's what's happening in that passage. We move forward to verse 30. And then at last, the sign of the Son of Man, that the Son of Man is coming, will appear in the heavens, and there will be a deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, remember I said everything up until verse 35 is an answer to the first question, which already has already taken place. So, that being said, it, we, at first blush, we, it might, we might be tempted to interpret this as the second coming of Jesus Christ to earth, right? Isn't that what, isn't that what it sounds like? I'm going to read it again. And then at last, the sign of the Son of Man is coming, will appear in the heavens, and there will be a deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Doesn't it sound like, at first reading, that that's Jesus coming to earth? But what we, when we, he, what we know from this passage, in order to get the correct interpretation, is that he's quoting Daniel 7, 13 through 14. And what is happening in that passage? The Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days. Uh, uh, very popular passage, the passage we've seen time and again as we look at Revelation. 
this verse, since it quotes Daniel 7, 13, 14, speaks not of Jesus coming to earth, but of Jesus coming to God in heaven at his ascension to receive authority, which he in turn uses to judge Jerusalem, which Jesus already predicted was going to happen at the end of chapter 23. So what Jesus is talking about is the coming of the Son of Man coming to is, is not him coming to earth, but coming to heaven, to the throne room of God. He receives that authority, and then he in turn uses that authority to judge Jerusalem, and that's the result is not one stone will be left upon another. Verse 31. And he will send out his angels with a mighty blast of the trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. What does that sound like? What, what, what's being described here is this refers to the gathering of new Christians into the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel. Now, verse 36, we, be, we, we are transitioning on to the answer of that second question, the unexpected of coming of the Son of Man. <clears throat> so when is Jesus coming again and what, what will be the sign? Can you guys tell me when Jesus is coming? Here's why I know you can't. So we need to really be careful uh, to not set dates or listen to those who do set dates. You know how many times people have set a date for the return of Jesus Christ and they've been wrong? I don't know. Do you? But it's happened a lot. I mean, it's even happened recently. I'm I'm gonna tell you the answer to this question because I know it's correct because it's the answer that Jesus gives about answering the same question. That's why I know it's right. But see, when people predict these dates, up until the date, their ministry grows. They become very popular. They make a lot of money oftentimes in many cases. But then they're found out to be wrong, and then they modify their original prophecy. So I just want to get, again, this is helpful for us because we don't often spend a lot of time here, that when you hear dates set... We got to check it with scripture and Matthew 24 is an excellent chapter to check it against Because here's Jesus's answer to this question in verse 36 However, when is Jesus going to come back the second coming? However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself Only the father knows Jesus doesn't know And I don't know Now you say, how does Jesus not know? He's God but keep in mind, during his earthly ministry, he is <clears throat> he's relinquishing, he, Jesus is still God, he's still deity during his earthly ministry, but he's relinquishing his right to access to his omniscience during his earthly ministry, and he knows what the Father communicates to him as mediated through the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus knows. And that was part of him taking on flesh, what we call the incarnation, so that ultimately he could pay the penalty for our sin. So Jesus is saying in his, in his flesh, in t- having taken on flesh, in his humanity, this shows us the humanity of Jesus, even though he is God, that he, he doesn't know. So we prepare for the second coming of Christ, not by setting a date, but by always being ready. And this is where Jesus is... is this is his challenge for us this morning Matthew twenty four thirty seven. when the son of man returns it will be like it was in Noah's day in those days before the flood the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered the boat people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away and that is the way it will be when the son of man comes So in in that story, there's two classes of people. There's Noah and his family, eight people, who are prepared. Noah's preaching, warning. And then there's everybody else who ignored the warning, and they kept going going, uh, on, living life as if judgment was not coming. Matthew 24, verse 40. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. When, it, when this verb of being taken has, has the idea of taken to be with someone. So the verb, um, which means this verse speaks to those who are taken to be with Jesus. 
And we see that borne out by that same verb being at, used at other places in, in the same chapter. Matthew 24, 42. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. So Jesus is coming at a time when he's not expected. The only appropriate response is readiness. So how many times are people telling themselves that one day they'll get ready, but Jesus is saying he will come when people aren't ready. So because we don't know when Jesus is coming, we need to be living as if he could be coming at any second. So he doesn't catch, catch us off guard, not prepared. Jesus goes on to say in verse 45, a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing the, his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, hey, my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the, the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, most recently, who has Jesus been calling hypocrites? The religious leaders of Matthew 23. And Jesus is saying here that if, if you're not prepared, if you're not uh, living the light of his second coming, he's going to put you with all the hypocrites because that is, in fact, what you are. <clears throat> so we see two classes of people, those who serve others, because that's what he said he says the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them that's going to be important for us this morning we're almost done so stay, bear with me those who serve others and those who live in selfish exploitation of others let's make this even more clear selfish indulgence at the expense of others you know what, what's a common <laughs> example that we've seen even recently with reference to what's going on in our society today, the coronavirus? W what do we see? And this is just a, a simple example, but it, it points to the fact what's in the human heart. When times get rough, difficult, challenging, when we don't have access to, a, to essential resources, uh, it really reveals what's in our heart, doesn't it? When we see the hoarding of essential items at the grocery store, what, we're see, what we see when people are going out to socialize instead of social distancing, when they don't need to be, is only the beginning of what is in the human heart in times of crisis. That's just a, 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 a sample. So if, if you're hoarding things for yourself, you are, it's selfish, isn't it? Selfish indulgence, but it's at, keep in mind, whatever you do affects the community. It's at the expense of other people. So you have enough or too much, but that, that means and requires that someone else doesn't have any. And to be ready as Christians, we must in, not engage in such behavior. It, it's a helpful warning because it, this, this crisis, it, things can get much worse down the road. But other crises that come down come down so we can't engage in such behavior but while we simultaneously we're called to care for others that's, that's Jesus' answer the truth is we can't indulge in self, selfish indulgence at the expense of others at times of crisis we can't lose our head lose our faith to the point where we forget that it's opportunity still as it always has been to serve other people that's what Jesus is telling us that's important during these times while we're waiting for his return so I, I say all that to, to get to my <clears throat> challenge this morning because this is an opportunity for us as a church we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow 
we don't know how bad it's going to get. Uh, some are forecasting uh, a recession worse than 2008. Some people are, are expressing, experiencing uh, the possibility of not having an income. And I know the government's uh, making promises and they're trying to do what they can, but we don't know exactly what, what's going to happen. But here's what we can do. In, historically, what have Christians done when a plague would hit a city? There, are, there have been plagues uh, in the first few centuries since the time of Christ, uh, 160, AD 160, AD 260, uh, during times of plague, we look back just for perspective. What do we see Christians doing? There, during times of plagues, like in the Roman Empire, there were, it was said that there were 5,000 people dying per day throughout the Roman Empire. <clears throat> Some of these plagues were started because uh, Roman soldiers were having uh, interaction with the uh, the Near East, and out on the frif, uh, fringes or peripheral of the empire, they were they were encountering uh, different things and, and bringing them back and getting everybody sick. Much like what we saw with Ebola uh, crossing the Atlantic and and even coming to America instead of you know being stopped in in Africa. And here's what here's the word that went out during times of plague. In early Christianity, here, here's was they had no idea what was going on. They didn't know how to stop it, so they had one one command: stay away. So everybody was when they saw someone sick, they ran. You know what Christians did during these times? They didn't run away; they ran too. They joyfully served others, just as Jesus commanded us to do. And what what is said is they say, "Well, if wait, you just said." they didn't know what could be done like they had no idea what they were encountering and they certainly didn't know how to 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 address the problem like how, how would those in ancient times ha, uh, be, be able to work on a vaccine if they're experiencing influenza or smallpox or measles and this is what we speculate these these plagues were how would they address it? They didn't know how to. So you say Christians ran in. How could they even help? What we, what we learn from history is that even just basic nursing, when a person is too sick to get up, uh, they can't feed themselves. They can't perform basic, you know, get basic necessities. Christians would run in and just provide the basics, food and water for these people even though they didn't have any medicines or, or vaccines. And this dramatically changed and shifted the mortality rate. The result of this is that through basic care of their fellow, you know, Christians, brothers and sisters, but also people who are pagans, let's call, let's say, the more, peop, many more people survived. Whereas everybody else in the society was running away, and that, that's what I see. Like, if I take that pattern and I, and I look at Matthew 24, the options are we can run away and self per, per, uh, to preserve self, or we can cannot get caught up and say, okay, I want to be wise. I do want to take care of myself, and I do want to take care of my family. But also simultaneously, how can I always be looking to look out for other people? And that's, 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 what, that's my challenge this morning. That's it. So I said last week that this is like a trial run. It's actually not a trial run. You know, as far as an epidemic, now pandemic, affecting the world for our, our leaders, uh, our government leaders and, and uh, healthcare professionals, the CDC, to, to get prepared. Because compared to other things that have happened, we have, this uh, coronavirus has a low mortality rate. Of course, we don't ultimately know what it's going to be. It's actually higher than what was forecasted. But it's, it's certainly not at 25% or 50%. I said this is a trial run. You know, we're finding out that we don't have, you know, how hard is it for us as in America to, to get even uh, testing happening at the level it needs to. Just to get gloves and masks 
to do the basics. How, aren't, it doesn't seem like we're struggling in these basics. And so it makes me think, hey, we're not quite as advanced as we think. But see, this is not the first time this has actually happened. I said it was a trial run. There's been, what, Ebola, MERS, SARS, uh, Zika. And so we've had time to get prepared, but it was like, always like, you know, it won't get that bad, and we haven't put things in place. But I'm, I'm thinking here, this is the first time I've, I, in my lifetime that I've seen our society as a whole and our nation take something seriously. And my hope is that this will be a trial run, that we will get some things in place so that when the next plague come down, comes down the road, we'll be more experienced as a whole and we'll be uh, better prepared to handle it so that many fewer people can die. I do anticipate more of these things happening. Uh, Why do I think that? Well, it's interesting that the major outbreaks that have happened, and you know, some would argue that climate change. You say, "Whoa, that's a leap!" You just got politically incorrect. Now, what is the connection there? This is kind of just a quick aside, because here's one example: bats, fruit bats, right? Where have the majority, seventy-five percent of all the new things? that I just mentioned that have been affecting us, where have they come from? What's their source? Animals. So, and most often the animal that, that is the ultimate cause, poor guy, is the fruit bat, is, is our bats. Be, be careful of the bats, right? So bats are, these fruit bats, they live in the, the top of the canopy of these trees. They are most affected by the heat. They have, they are not being able to get the food they need at the tops of the trees in, in the, in the uh, tropical climates. And so they have left their original climate, and now they're they are going to uh, human civilization to be just to be able to feed themselves, and they're coming to in much more contact with humans. And that's that's the part of the problem that the level of uh, the depth, as far as asking the questions as to why is there seem to be an uptick, an upsurge in in uh, in more of these things happening, MERS, SARS, uh, Ebola, uh, Zika, and, and more on the horizon. Um, avian flu, swine flu. Some would argue, and they make a strong case, that it, has to, it ultimately has to do with climate change. And that's not something we're talking about in America. Our, our president, not to disrespect him in any way, uh, doesn't believe that this is even a thing. But if, if it is a thing, and that is part of the reason, and because we're not really doing anything about it with the level of intensity that we're addressing the coronavirus... It, um, that I, I expect more of it to happen. And coronavirus, if we look at it in this, through this lens, this context, it's merely a symptom of a, of a root problem that we're not addressing. And it's in, in some scientists who are observing all these things, what they say is um, humanity prospers to the degree that we take care of the animals. And what does that remind me of? Genesis chapter 1, our, the creation mandate, take care of the planet, Jesus, God tells us take care of the planet we're not doing a good job of that today the result is these outbreaks so i say all that to say i expect more on the horizon so here's my point this morning I, and you may disagree with that and i'm welcome to have a discussion because i want to learn more but to me the the new sources I, i'm looking at it's like they're not addressing the problem at a deep enough level to really meet my uh need for understanding so perhaps you have a, an alternative view, and I would be welcome to have the conversation with you. Just as this has, in some sense, a trial run that we're taking seriously. We've had other trial runs in the past. I feel like we've failed, but we're actually taking, I'm hoping we're going to go forward with this. It's also a trial run for who? The church. The church. And we, we're, we're at a crossroads right now. Because we have to, we always want to apply the truth to our culture, our context, our generation, our time. To, and so the trial run for the church is this. How do we get good at living out our faith, at taking care of others in these kinds of situations? How do we use our resources to help other people? That's going to be really difficult for us to help other people if we don't have any resources. And one of the things I like about the church is we have the opportunity to pool our resources so that we have more, because we're, we're better together, we have more to contribute and offer when we pool our resources together to help more people. Now, 
The temptation is to think that, oh, we don't have enough, I don't have enough for myself, for my family, so I won't be able to help anybody else. But you know what history teaches us? Is that we can always do something. You have people that have stepped up and they've started out as a volunteer in some of these outbreaks and the result of, uh, over the course of a lifetime, say for instance, eradicating the smallpox um, that, that ended, I think it was 1980, They've gone from be, be just starting out as a volunteer to end up being an expert in their field. That was through a volunteer effort. Th- this is, this is uh, an example to us of people who didn't run away in fear, but ran to and actually addressed the problem. And this, so it's, it's us, our training wheels for us. Now, I am not talking about doing good works that are surface, shallow things that are naive merely so we can tap ourselves on the back as Christians so we can put ourselves up on a pedestal and and convince ourselves and other people look how awesome we are when in fact we never really put ourselves at risk now I'm not talking about being foolish either we want to be wise as serpents harmless as doves right so wisdom what does wisdom say and oftentimes, I feel like in times of crisis we can lose our heads and we can have a thereof what form of godliness was like okay I, it's all about religious freedom you know it's like wait a minute is god wise in order for us to be godly we have to exercise wisdom so what what if we come together we continue to pull our resources to think how can we help people help people in our church and people outside of our church in our community in substantive ways where they really need help I'm not talking about enabling people or just making life more convenient, but I'm talking about uh, helping people at a level where it's actually significant and substantive that communicates the gospel. That is, Jesus gave up his life for other people. So I'm not, I'm not arguing, also I'm not arguing that we run in head, headlong into, into foolishness where we give up our lives unnecessarily or contract the coronavirus unnecessarily because like, oh, I don't need a mask, I don't have to wash my hands, God will protect me. That's to presume upon God. Did not God give us wisdom? Isn't that part of his provision for us? So can we use that wisdom, wash our hands, wear masks, practice social distancing, but also as we, as we go forward, because they don't know what's going to happen in this crisis and the one down the road, can we get good at being prepared ourselves as a church to help, to shine a light? When others run away, we're prepared to run forward. And really, I think it's going to take all of us together coming forward with, with the, our collective wisdom to think, how can we get traction in times like this? This is new for us. It's new for me. And it may be like, oh, everybody's overreacting. It's fear. But then the idea of um, one of our people at uh, Gospel Life Church, they, uh, someone at their workplace contracted the coronavirus. Now, thankfully... Uh, this person I'm referring to, they were working from home the whole time. They didn't have any exposure, but that just really brought a home for me. Like, what if our one of our own people contracts this and gets sick, maybe even dies? Like that. That and I, it was. I want to do everything I can to ha- make that not happen. And so we need to, to we need to be wise with our own resources in our own families with our own income but we also need to be collectively on the lookout for how we can help that's what Jesus that, that's what Jesus commands us to do to serve others now you could say well he's only talking about the leaders who are to preach and feed that is the, to teach and preach the, the word of God but a cup of cold water in the next chapter right the very next chapter So that's the challenge for us how are, how are we going to live out our faith not get so <clears throat> given so much to fear and confusion where we completely isolate and hoard but such but but keep our heads keep our faith be in prayer be be listening uh and sensitive to the leading of the holy spirit so that we can use our resources to help and serve and be live out our faith even in situations like this There's, here's, let me give you, leave you with this hope. There's always something we can do. No matter how bad it gets, God will provide. He, there's always something. We never have to be f- so full of fear 
that we wouldn't be able to, to, to reach out to help someone thinking that we won't have enough. Can God provide for us during this time? And again, I'm not, not, I'm not saying, oh, God will provide so we can do things that are foolish, but hey, we can always do something if we try. It's amazing what our church can do when we put our, when we step out in faith and come together corporately, I'm always amazed at people's generosity and their creativity in reaching out to people. So that's my challenge for this morning. Let's be thinking about that in, in, the, in the days ahead as we move forward in this time, but also in the times down the road. Let's pray. Father, we want to live out our faith. We want to be prepared. Lord, we, we have you. We have a relationship with you, and so we can have peace even in these times. Lord, but I, my, my hope, my desire is, Lord, that we wouldn't miss opportunities and getting so caught up in our own lives that we forget that we, we need to be there for each other and for those in our community. Lord, give us wisdom, but Lord, give us, uh, lead us and guide us by the power of your Holy Spirit so we can do something beautiful, even in, in dark times. Lord, help us to give us wisdom with our resources, but Lord, cause our resources to stretch, please, further than they would have, could have otherwise. Lord, you are cause, you are able to make li a little go a long way. And Lord, that's by your power. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.